Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromecha Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things lovely in the maker and embedded world. Now, of course, we will be talking this week about the new Raspberry Pi 400, but we have a lot of other updates for you too, including things from funding websites and some projects we've seen throughout the week, along with, of course, the mystery box competition. So let's get on with the show. So first up this week, we are of course talking about the new Raspberry Pi 400, which in case you haven't noticed, although it has been everywhere in the last day or so since it's been released, um, it is a Raspberry Pi, it is inside a keyboard. In fact, the same keyboard that was originally just the standalone Raspberry Pi keyboard. And here it is, and it does look exactly like a Raspberry Pi keyboard. Now, I'm not gonna lie, when the Raspberry Pi keyboard itself was released, I thought, okay, Raspberry Pi branded keyboard, that's cool, but it did seem a little bit kind of why? But this is probably why, um, because it is exactly the same form factor, as far as I know. Um, I haven't had my hands on a Raspberry Pi 400 uh, yet. I'm hoping to get one in the coming days. But um, it looks like it is exactly the same case as the Raspberry Pi keyboard. They've just cut some slits in it for cooling and cut some slits in the back for the ports. So this image from the Raspberry Pi shop tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the new Raspberry Pi 400. It's the first one that's uh, of a different form factor since they brought out the compute modules all that time ago. And while they went for slightly smaller, this is going for larger and more convenient. Um, and so as you can see here, this is obviously where the USB mouse attaches and it does ship with a mouse if you get the Raspberry Pi 400 kit. Um, there is a kit which is $100 which comes with a mouse and all the connecting cables along with uh, the official Raspberry Pi beginner's guide which is worth it. They're good books. Like I said last week, the Raspberry Pi Press put out very good books, um, but you can get it just standalone for $70 as well. Now, um, back here, these are the dual HDMI out ports, I think, or perhaps, no, I'm reading that wrong. One of these is going to be a power port, isn't it? So one of these will be the USB-C power import, and one of them will be a micro or mini HDMI. I always mix those two things up. So uh, you can see here exactly what is going on. Um, at the back here, you still have access to all the GPIO pins, so um, all of the projects that you were doing with the Pi can still be done. I do wonder whether you're going to be able to fit any Raspberry Pi hats on the back of this thing, but then again, that's maybe not the focus of this board particularly. And you get most of the same things that you get with the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, you just get the one USB 2 port, uh, but you still have two USB 3 ports, and as I said, micro, you, um, you, sorry, USB Type-C for power and two micro HDMI ports. Or are they mini HDMI? Let's settle this once and for all. Micro, I was right, micro HDMI. Ian got something right. I can say micro HDMI, I can say FPGA. Please say I got FPGA right. Yes, I can say things correctly. Anyway, so much has already been said about the Raspberry Pi 400. I don't really know what I can add to it. There are a couple of things about it that are notable for sure. Um, the CPU inside the Raspberry Pi 400 is the same one as in the Raspberry Pi 4, but it is clocked slightly higher. It comes as standard clocked at 1.8 gigahertz. Now, as we all know from the fantastic video that I showed a few weeks ago from explainingcomputers.com, uh, you can clock the Raspberry Pi 4 up to uh, well over two gigahertz, although I'd stay at maybe two if you want things to run smoothly. Um, so this coming with a slightly faster processor um, isn't that surprising, but by the same token, it is kind of crazy that this, which is essentially a very different kind of Raspberry Pi to the ones that have come before, is now the most powerful Raspberry Pi in terms of CPU out there. Now, the only thing that is a little bit different about it is the $70, which is, of course, the same price as the 8 gigabyte Raspberry Pi 4, gets you this Raspberry Pi with, like I said, a, a better CPU, but it only comes with 4 gigabytes of RAM. Um, I don't necessarily know whether that will be too much of an issue unless you're really pushing it, um, but they are also sort of pushing this as something which can be used as a day-to-day -day computer, as you're seeing from the video that's playing in front of me as I speak. Um, they're kind of pushing it to be a little bit more of a, a, a do-it-all device rather than just something for education and DIY learning. Um, but that said, the uh, GPIO pins are out there, you can use them. Um, and the thing for me that makes this uh, a good addition to the Raspberry Pi fleet, as it were, is the fact that it is compact and all-in-one. I've had a few conversations with uh, people about this, and a, a few people are kind of saying, what, so it's, it's not in a regular form factor, it's got this uh, terrible membrane keyboard attached to it, although I don't particularly mind membrane keyboards that much, um, and so it's, you know, it's just useless. Whereas I see it much as the namesake, I mean, it's named after the Atari 400, and this idea of having a keyboard which just plugs into any HDMI port, be that a monitor or the television in the living room, um, and then you have something which is a little bit more like bridges the gap in my mind between, say, a console and a, a retro computer that would attach to a screen. 
Now, others have quite rightly pointed out that I am talking rubbish, and the only thing that is different here is that you don't need a spare keyboard. Um, the opinions are going to be divided about this one, but I certainly think that uh, for the use case that I just mentioned, this idea of uh, you know not having to pull out an extra monitor and stick it on a desk that may not have much space on it in order to use a Raspberry Pi, say with your kids, and just being able to attach the Raspberry Pi to the computer and a mouse um, and bear in mind that uh, if you have any kind of casting or wireless HDMI capabilities, then that's going to be a great thing you can use for this as well. This could be uh, something that you keep on the sofa and have a wireless mouse next to you and just cast straight to the screen. And of course, let's not forget that this is a powerful CPU, the same CPU that is in the Raspberry Pi 4, and that RetroPi and other retro gaming outfits work now on that architecture. So you could have the perfect sort of do-it-all little machine that includes retro gaming in your living room. And that to me is so damn cool. Like I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sold on this. I think you can maybe tell. So before moving on, one last interesting thing about this to me is that um, it is much like the Raspberry Pi 4 passively cooled. Now I know the Raspberry Pi 4 when it first came out had some cooling issues, which I believe were fixed by firmware. Um, and I've certainly not had any trouble uh, with my Raspberry Pi 4 that I'm using um, over here. Uh, that is, uh, not being overclocked if I remember correctly so that might have something to do with it. Um, this is also passively cooled um, and it's in a uh, enclosed in a case which makes me wonder how on earth they've managed to do it. Um, I do wonder without wanting to doubt what they've made here I do wonder whether uh, long-term use especially if it is being used with televisions in the living room and it's on carpets or even worse on people's knees if overheating might eventually be an issue. Um, but keeping the heat down on even laptops if they're on your knee, no matter how good the laptop is, is something that is not a complete science. No one's managed to fix that yet. Um, we human beings are warm things. We give off heat all the time. So it's probably a very small uh, thing uh, to worry about. But yes, I am kind of sold on this. Um, I will be getting one relatively soon. Um, and I, as I do with most Raspberry Pis, I like to try and actually use them as a day-to-day -day thing. I, I found the Raspberry Pi 4 to be good enough to do almost all of my day-to-day -day writing tasks and even some basic image editing. Um, and uh, one day, maybe one day, we will actually try filming an entire Electromaker show using just Raspberry Pis. Um, that is something I've had in the pipeline for a while and it's getting close to being a reality. But anyway, um, I'll let you know when I've got mine as to how I think of it. Um, and this is, like I say so often on this show, um, if you were ever thinking of getting someone a Raspberry Pi as a present, like a Christmas present or something like that, uh, this is the most accessible one so far. Send it to them, they can plug it into their telly and they have the Raspberry, uh, the Raspberry Pi OS waiting for them with everything that comes with it. Now, staying with the Raspberry Pi, uh, Android as an operating system and the Raspberry Pi have a relatively long history. As far back as 2013, you can find people porting Android to the Raspberry Pi. And ever since then, there's been various groups of people that have tried to make Android work seamlessly on the Raspberry Pi, because there are other single board computers out there that are designed with Android in mind. Now, this isn't as simple as you may think, because despite the Raspberry Pi being an ARM device and Android running on ARM devices, there are some driver conflicts that make this a not easy job. And yet, still, there are people out there, completely open source developers, just doing it as a hobby or a passion that are making it work. And now, the Android 11 operating system is working almost seamlessly on the Raspberry Pi 4 with just a few problems. And as always, it's something that stemmed out of the XDA forums, which is a hotbed for this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yes, rather than go through every single detail of it, because there is a lot, um, I will just say two things. The first is, if you would like to get Android 11 working on the Raspberry Pi 4, um, it takes a little bit more than just your average flashing of an image that you might be used to for an operating system. Um, uh, if you look at the GitHub and the README file, there are a few things that you need to be aware of. Um, it is a 64-bit only build, so if you haven't updated the firmware on your Pi, you will need to do that. Um, and there are a few other uh, there are a few other flags that you need to be aware of. There's a, a config file um, that will help you with that. Now um, there is also a very long uh, forum post about it on the XDA forums, and this thread goes on for pages and pages. And it is a very useful thing to have because as well as all of the information here for how to do it. Um, there is people who have been trying this and uh, asked questions about it. Um, one of the people in this thread mentions that it does work with a generic touchscreen that they bought from, uh, I think, AliExpress or eBay. Um, so this does seem to have quite a lot of functionality. Um, now, there are uh, a few things that you should be aware of before trying it, though. So the things to be aware of, I mean, there's a couple of things here. It works in tablet mode, which I think is kind of sort of better. I don't understand why you'd want your Raspberry Pi to be an Android TV. I mean, I know some people use them as a media center, but this, to me, makes a lot more sense. There's a lot more functionality in Android tablet mode. 
and you need at least four gigabytes of RAM on the Raspberry Pi, that makes sense. Now, no hardware accelerated video playback will be something that I think some people will be quite disappointed about. That does cut back on um, being able to use this device for playing video. Um, and uh, uh, there's a couple of other things that uh, aren't written here, but for example, I know that you can't use it as a hotspot, for example, and there's a few little issues here and there with graphics. Now, this isn't to say this isn't a fantastic piece of work by Max Venn and uh, anyone else who happens to be on the same team working on OmniROM. Um, getting it working this well is truly fantastic. Uh, I, this this uh, story broke very soon before me doing the show. Um, I do have a little bit of a history of putting Android on Raspberry Pis. I've written tutorials on it in the past, um, and I've always kept a weather eye on it just to see um, how it would work because uh, it's just something I find kind of interesting. But it has always in my mind been something that you would do sort of just to see if you could do it. It's sort of the, 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 hacker, in your, uh, the hacker in you that wants to put one operating system on, on another thing. And that's one of the reasons that I'm also completely preoccupied with the idea of building Hackintosh computers. I used to have a PC laptop, which was an Apple laptop in a PC's body. And it didn't work perfectly, but it was fine because I had made it work. And that is what this will be as well. I don't think there's any real use for it, but the fact that we're getting an almost perfect version of Android 11 on Raspberry Pi 4 is fantastic and it deserves praise. And if you do want to uh, follow this and if you do want to try it for yourself, I will link this XDA developers uh, 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 article here and you can find all of the information linked in the body of the text. And now moving on to a new SBC, namely the Orange Pi 02 All Winner H616. Now this is sort of interesting, um, as the start of this article on CNX Software mentions, um, the Orange Pi Zero 2 was actually unveiled last year, um, and it was an update to the Orange uh, Pi Zero, um, and it seemed like it would be kind of cool, it's got a faster processor, it's got, it's got a small form factor, um, and I remember it being announced. Now one of the things I never noticed is that it just never actually appeared, as it mentions here in the article. Um, he says, as far as he knows, they never sold it, and as far as I know as well, it, I, I've never seen it for sale but it is now back and it has a better processor and it runs Android 10 natively, which is of course different to the Raspberry Pi project we were just talking about before. So as I mentioned, the new system on chip it has is a lot faster. It is a, a quad core ARM Cortex A53 processor running at up to 1.5 gigahertz with an ARM Mali G31 MP2 GPU with support for OpenGL and a couple of other things. Um, and you can see as well, it's got a lot of ports, uh, which will be useful. I do like the fact that a board this small has a full ethernet port on it. That's always a nice thing. That means this is something you could leave somewhere um, and it could be the, you know, it could be the center of a smart home setup. It could be used in, I imagine this is gonna be something that might be actually used somewhat in industry just because of a, uh, I imagine they're gonna be quite cheap and they do have quite powerful processors without having that much RAM. This is the sort of thing that would fit perfectly in an embedded environment like that. It has a single USB 2 port, a micro HDMI port, a USB Type-C power supply, and um, a UART for debugging. Then a 26-pin expansion port on one side, and then the other side is a 13-pin function interface, which I think is kind of interesting. This is designed specifically for things like headphones, USB 2, TV out, and infrared receivers. Um, and then as you can see here, there's the dual band Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5.0, um, along with a couple of other things. Um, now, as I mentioned, these uh, boards are uh, fantastic, and um, I do think that uh, Orange Pi have certainly taken a step up from some of their earlier boards in terms of making them accessible to people, and the documentation is way better than it used to be. Uh, but this is still something that I imagine is, is treading the line between two places. Um, because if you were working on prototyping uh, an embedded device for industry, then this is kind of a very feature-rich and very small board, which comes with Wi-Fi on board. And as you can see, it comes with a Wi-Fi aerial on board, which is a little thing, but it's a thing nonetheless. Yeah, I do find this board kind of compelling because it does have quite a powerful processor on it. Um, and while it is lacking in memory, depending on what you're using it for, that might not be the worst problem in the world. Um, it's got the two megabytes of SPI flash on it and a micro SD card slot and a few of the other things that I've already mentioned. Um, but the main thing about this board that I find really compelling is the price. Now, currently the official account of the creators of the Orange Pi Zero doesn't have the Orange Pi Zero 2 listed, but it is listed on Amazon.com US. Um, and there are two options, uh, the 512 megabyte RAM version for $15.99 and the one gigabyte version for $18.99. Um, and for a board this powerful and this small, that seems like a very, very low price indeed. 
So I will leave a link to the CNX software article in the uh, description of this video. Um, and uh, yeah, Orange Pi keep coming out with compelling little boards and this one is no different. Um, and uh, if you are someone who is interested in getting something a little bit different and maybe a little bit smaller as an alternative to the Raspberry Pi Zero that has maybe a little bit more functionality, this is definitely worth a look. And now onto a section of the show we like to call Funding Website Things. That is, things that appear on funding websites. If you fund them on a website, they are thick. Okay, Ian. And to begin this week, the skull. Yes, I talked about the skull before. The skull CTF is something that got me very excited when it was announced, and now it has launched, and it is already 67% of the way to its $666 goal. Of course. Of course it's $666 goal. Um, there's a little bit more information now as to what this was. This is the only thing that was there when this was first launched, just the poem. Um, and now uh, there is a little bit more information about it, and it is very, very interesting indeed. And as with most Capture the Flags, they've given maybe a little bit more details as to what it is, but really not very much. Uh, the idea here is that you are supposed to work out what to do and how to capture the flag, which is inside the brain of this skull. Um, and as you can see, uh, it is a uh, decorative and spooky is what they say, and it definitely is. Um, and if you scroll slightly further down, you can see an image of the back of the skull, which features the AT tiny chip that they've mentioned, along with a little header here for programming and a little touch sensitivity, uh, a little, sorry, a little touch sensitive panel here that you can press to make it flash. Because when you're not using it as a puzzle, then you can use it as a badge for Halloween, which uh, has actually already passed, but yeah, whatever. Um, I, I'm quite a fan of skeletons at Christmas time. It, it spices things up a bit. I want to say there isn't much information about the puzzle here, I mean it. There's a lot of well-written stuff here, but the only actual useful information is the things you will need is the ability to read and understand our Arduino code, a willingness to spend some quality time with the AT45 datasheet, and some basic programming skills. Now, as I mentioned, there's a program header uh, on the back of the skull here, although it does mention that it's not included in the standard version of the skull, but I imagine you could probably add that yourself. This thing is very open hardware after all. Which means that even if you didn't manage to solve the puzzle or had no interest in doing so, what you have is a very stylish little AT Tiny board that you can use to learn to program AT Tiny 45 chips. And learning to program AT Tiny 45 chips is a very good next step on from programming standard Arduino boards because AT Tiny are from the same family of chips as the AT uh, Mega 32HP chips you find on Arduino Unos and similar. Anyway, I find the skull a wonderful idea for a CTF. Um, there aren't enough uh, cheap uh, hardware CTFs or at least CTFs that are a little bit more accessible to people um, out there so this is something that makes me very very happy indeed. If you'd like to get a hold of the Skull the early bird version is $16 and the main version is $20. There are also multi-packs and interestingly there is a programmer and header you can get for it as well um, and if you did get this programmer and header then you would be able to program the Skull yourself but as I mentioned um, what you could also do is program uh, is solder headers onto it yourself and work out how to program it yourself. That would sort of be yet another level above. Um, but yeah, uh, an all-in-all -all, uh, kit for working with the AT Tiny that's already put together, it doesn't involve you doing any SMD soldering, is not a bad thing to have. And like I say, I just think this is such a novel idea. It really appeals to me. Anyhow, there will be a link to the skull in the description of this video. Staying with CrowdSupply this week, and another project which isn't actually directly a development board, it's something which is a bit different once again, and this is Kokio's Project Cases. And this is quite an elegant little idea. Um, Calfish Studios, who are the maker of this, um, got a little bit sick of using just generic plastic boxes for their projects when they'd made circuit boards, because they, like me, think that circuit boards are actually quite beautiful things. Um, so they designed some cases which are designed to showcase your circuit board rather than hide it away in an enclosure. Now the design might be familiar to a few of you because uh, some of the Raspberry Pi cases that we saw when the Raspberry Pi first came out were essentially just pieces of acrylic and standoffs in order just to stop dust and things falling on the top of the Pi or metal things falling on the top of the Pi and making unwanted connections. Um, these will have the same problems as those acrylic cases in that there are gaps at the side and things could still fall in and foul up your hardware. But really, this is designed to show off your circuit boards and I don't think you're going to be using these in any kind of industrial or heavy use uh, environment. 
And as I mentioned, they provide PCB templates for most major EDA tools. Um, and yeah, look, I mean, it's just, it, this is just a simple and nice idea. And as I've said many, many times in the past, there's nothing wrong with simple. Um, they may not be the only people who are doing this. You could absolutely just do this for yourself. Um, but there's an elegance to this, in my opinion. It's a nice design behind it. And given that the small project case is only $20, um, as is the medium case, as is the large case, as is the extra large case, all just $20, um, it's certainly worth a look if you are someone who creates your own printed circuit boards. Anyway, as always, I will leave a link to the Kokio project case in the description of this video. Um, and if you do end up getting one and you do end up putting one of your printed circuit boards in it, send me a picture. I'd love to see it. And now moving over to Kickstarter and something which is obviously very exciting for me because it is a microcontroller audio digital signal processing board. That's right, this Opus Max board is based on the STM32. Uh, I can't remember exactly which chip it is. I will look that up again in a second. And as you can see, um, a, 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 it is a board designed with audio in mind. Um, it has various inputs and outputs, and they are 24-bit DACs on them, and as you can see from this chart here. 24-bit uh, uh, analog to digital converters and digital, or, and digital to analog converters. Whoa, it's hard to say. Um, along with a bunch of other things that make it perfect for making sound and music and uh, changing audio on the fly. Now, I think the main use case for this is that you are going to want to plug things into one end, put effects on them, and plug it out of the other end. Um, the Kickstarter itself uh, is a lot of text without much in the way of images, um, and of course, I'm not going to read through all of it. Um, to me, this is absolutely fascinating. This is something that I don't think either the Raspberry Pi or any kind of Arduino boards have come close to. Um, I know I seem to mention them in almost every single show that we do, but this is definitely closer to something like what Baylor uh, does with their platform. But of course, Baylor is very small um, and has limited inputs and outputs, um, which, uh, whereas this uh, is something which is a lot larger. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to go back into the video to get an image of it. There we go. Um, obviously, a lot larger. It has uh, audio inputs and outputs as standard. Um, yes, this is a massive wall of text um, that I have skimmed through. Um, I think the uh, things that most people will find interesting here is, like I said, uh, there are two stereo uh, out uh, 3.5 millimeter audio jacks with 24 bit stereo DACs, two stereo uh, audio jacks with stereo uh, analog to digital converters, uh, four MIDI in, four MIDI out, and then a USB type, USB type B connector for power and a USB type A connector for communication with USB devices like MIDI controllers, a micro SD card slot, and an expansion connector with a 40 pin pin header. Um, now, uh, this is a lot to go through, but what I have picked up from this, just from reading through it about, uh, reading through it, is that this is meant to be something that is completely lightweight. Um, there's no operating system on here. Um, they go into why they chose not to actually do uh, run a Linux operating system on the board in here, um, and why they're doing it completely on hardware. Um, uh, and yeah, there's there's a lot to this. Um, again, there's a wall of text, not very many images for me to show you, and I don't want to bore you by just reading stuff off the Kickstarter, but in short, um, this is a very interesting alternative to other microcontroller or single board computer uh, versions of audio digital signal processing, um, and it's certainly worth a look. Now, one thing that might put people off is the price. Um, as it's saying here, uh, it's around 136 euros, um, and that might be a little bit more than some people are willing to pay. But this board does offer something that I don't think any other one does. This is a very low level way of working. Um, as you can see next to it here, actually, one of the uh, things that they provide is a config file to auto generate the source code using STM32 Cube MX, um, which is a, a GUI tool that you can use to uh, generate all of the configuration things you would need for any particular STM chip um, in order to then program it. Because if you've ever worked with the uh, STM32 chips using STM's own uh, software, it's quite a learning curve to even just set a chip up to use it. Um, and so uh, this is not something that's going to be for absolute beginners. This is something that's going to take a long time to get used to if you're not already familiar with this kind of programming. If you don't know much about dig digital signal processing and programming, programming microcontrollers, this is going to be something you will have and learn with for a long time. Um, but I didn't want to uh, put this show out without mentioning it, just because uh, I'm someone that kind of keeps their ear to the ground somewhat in terms of things like this. And this one did stand out to me as being slightly unique. Uh, mystery box competition! Yes, indeed, this is the mystery box competition. I've done this so often that I don't think I need to explain it to you. This is a mystery box. You can win something from it by leaving a comment on the video. I reach in, I grab something, and I pull it out. And this is a wireless connectivity cape. Element 14. 
Ah, add Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and NFC functionality to the BeagleBone Black. Now, since I've started this competition, I did say that I did suspect at some point there would be a prize that might not be 100% useful to the winner unless they had specific equipment. This is the very first time that has happened because what I believe this is, is a Wi-Fi cape for the BeagleBone Black mini Linux computer. So unless you have a BeagleBone Black, this might not be all that useful for you. However, perhaps winning this as a prize might interest you in getting started with BeagleBone. They do have a very, very nice way of doing things. I'm quite a fan of BeagleBone. Um, so yes, uh, we have a prize now, so all we need is a winner. Just before we do that though, I'm gonna try and hold this up to the camera just so you can see what I'm talking about. As you can see, this is in the familiar BeagleBone form factor, but if you look at the bottom, there, there are all the pins that will attach it to the baseboard, which would be a BeagleBone baseboard. Now, this is a fairly powerful little Wi-Fi attachment. Um, it doesn't just do Wi-Fi, it also has Bluetooth 4.0 and Bluetooth low energy capabilities. And as I mentioned before, it's compatible with things like Zigbee. So um, yes, this is the first time I'm giving away something that isn't necessarily directly useful to someone, um, but this is still a quite nice little bit of kit. And I really hope whoever wins it will get a beagle bone and have a little play with it rather than just letting this thing gather dust. But then again, maybe they have a friend that has a beagle bone that wants a wireless cape. I don't know, I don't know these things. I am not a mind reader yet. Anyway, my silly waffling aside, the winner this week is Colin Russell Conway, who pointed out on a comment on last week's video that I'd missed a few key features of the new RISC-V chips that are supposed to be fighting the ESP8266 for the crown. And uh, yes, thank you for that comment. I had missed that, and maybe that's something we will revisit in a future episode when my development board arrives, because yes, I did order one. But anyway, um, I hope you do get some use out of this Wi-Fi hood. Uh, we'll be in touch with you as to how we can get it out to you. And for anyone else that would like to enter the mystery box competition, you just have to leave a comment on our video. But of course, if you leave a comment on our video with no intention of winning the mystery box prize, just telling us what you think of the show or what you're up to, we'd love that as well. But anyway, let's get on with the rest of the show. And now moving on to a few projects from the internet this week. Uh, now, CN Law is an American YouTuber who has been uploading programming videos for years. He has done amazing things with the ESP8266, including running a Minecraft server on it, along with various other things. Um, he is one of the most inspiring coding YouTubers to me. I've been watching him for a very long time and I've been waiting to feature him on this show. This week he has released a video about uh, programming a seven color e-ink display to make a picture frame present for his mum. Now the idea here is that he would give her the uh, thing in a picture frame and it would look like a normal picture frame with a sort of low quality picture in it and then at night the picture would change to a new picture and the idea was it was sort of a fun gift slash trick that she would be, oh, I'm sure there's a different picture in that frame and uh, it becomes something different. Um, now he has uh, live streamed the process of trying to get this thing working and his approach to uh, this is uh, exactly the kind of stuff that I've talked about on the show a few times that is something that's in my mind is something I'd like to do because he uh, he programs in pure C in a regular text editor and uh, just is yeah he's uh, uh, Mr. Computer Science as far as I'm concerned um, and uh, this is an example of something that perfectly uh, shows how you can interface with different peripherals using different chips. And I understand that I was tripping off my words a little bit as I was saying that, but it's because re-watching this video even with the sound off um, reminds me of how sort of amazing it is. Now, this video is mostly just an overview of how we got it working, talking about the uh, initial uh, attempts to get it working with an STM32 chip before switching out to a different chip and the uh, things that he did in order to make that an easy process. And what you're seeing now as well is an e-ink display under a microscope, which is fascinating seeing how it changes. And much like he says in the video, I have no idea quite how they achieve this. It's amazing. Anyway, the video covers pretty much every aspect of how it was made, including fitting it all into a picture frame um, and how we made it uh, last and low power for a very long time. And of course, showing it in action. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's something that has to change at night because it can take up to 15 to 30 seconds for it to change completely. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just such a wonderful idea. Um, and as well as him being one of my favorite YouTubers, you know I'm a big fan of people showing these kind of projects from start to finish and exactly how they achieved it, sharing their thoughts, sharing what they got right and sharing what they got wrong. And as I said before, uh, CN Law is just one of my favorite YouTubers. It's just incredible the amount of stuff that he's put on his channel over the years. He's worked with VR. He's, as I've said, installed uh, the ESP8266 uh, on, sorry, installed Minecraft on an ESP8266. He's uh, coded Android apps directly in C. Um, and some of his older videos show him creating uh, PCBs out of glass uh, to put uh, surface mount 
chips and LEDs and things on that he did completely at home. Um, and uh, oh, also, if you're familiar with um, Color Chord, which is a, uh, a library for making uh, sound reactive LEDs, he is the author of Color Chord as well. So yes, I'm obviously quite a big fan of this guy. I'm very happy that we've finally uh, had the opportunity to put him on the show. And if you are uh, interested in programming in C and lots and lots of fun ways to hack and work with code, C and Law is a channel that you will enjoy very much indeed. And now over to the Raspberry Pi subreddit with an LED matrix that you can draw on using an iPad app. And this isn't a standard app you can get on the uh, App Store. Um, uh, it isn't a thing you can buy. This has been made completely by scratch from user Gorse212. And as you can see, it's really quite pretty. Um, the idea behind it, obviously, is that you can uh, uh, paint onto the pixel display on the iPad, which is the same size as the LED display in the background, choose your colors, and then paint on top of it. Now, as it says, the tablet is an older iPad um, and there is an LED matrix and then communicating between the iPad and the matrix is a Raspberry Pi. Now, there isn't uh, much details as to the uh, build process, but there is a GitHub for both the matrix and how it's been set up, um, which is a C++ application. Um, and uh, it, there's a few things here as to how it all fits together as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, I don't really know much about uh, uh, interfacing with matrices this big. I do have uh, a couple of larger ones, which I got uh, for a project which will be coming up soon. Um, but uh, I'd be very interested in reading up a bit more on it, uh, which is something I'm going to do in my spare time. But as I say, yes, um, uh, the Python on the Raspberry Pi and C++ in order to get the matrix running. And there is also the uh, iPad app, which he's posted on GitHub as well. And that is written in Swift, which, uh, if you're not familiar, is Apple's uh, terrifying language, which is supposed to be nicer to use than Objective-C. But if you ever try to run uh, it in Apple's IDE, it runs terrifyingly slowly, even when you try to print to the console. I'm sure I've just made a few people angry by saying that. I don't really hate Swift. <laughs> Anyway, the proof is in this video and it is fantastic. It does look wonderful. Um, I will leave a link to the Raspberry Pi subreddit post, which has links to both of these GitHub libraries, along with a few uh, other comments from the creator, which can tell you a little bit more about it. Up next on the substandard human assistant subreddit, this is a little thing that locks the door when you open an incognito tab. Now, I don't really understand why anyone would need something like this, you know, when you open an incognito tab, I don't really understand why you wouldn't want anyone coming in the room or anything like that. <laughs> now, I saw this video on the uh, substandard human assistant subreddit, the, uh, the, the, the not so goody robots subreddit, um, but it was actually uh, ripped from a video from the useless duck company, um, who I believe we have featured on this show before actually. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, this, uh, this is a very fun project. I really do like the idea behind it. Um, I have actually fiddled around with uh, locks in the past. I wrote a tutorial a while ago, which was uh, to do with RFID and locking doors with Arduino. Um, and this is, it's actually kind of funny because when I first saw this, I was gonna make a joke about how, oh yes, well I absolutely need incognito mode because what I like to do is uh, open an incognito tab and I. I need to make sure that the door is locked so that, my, uh, so that my partner doesn't come in and catch me looking at test equipment from the 1970s because that's kind of what I'm looking at at the minute. I really want to get some big boxes of test equipment and see if I can make them make music. Anyway, um, this is, uh, again, something I say over and over again, a nice, simple project linking one thing to the other, just uh, working out how you can make one thing on your computer, communicate with a microcontroller and communicate with that microcontroller to act on the world around you, whether you do it via USB or whether you do it by, via Wi-Fi. Having a project in mind is the best way to learn things. And I will link this video in the description, which tells you roughly the approach that was taken and, of course, is very funny. And finally, a project on the Arduino subreddit from DIY Maxwell, who we have featured on the show before. He was the one that had the, those amazing little stop motion Lego bricks that were designed to uh, uh, work as a camera mount, which was actually from the 3D printing subreddit. And he is back with an indoor hockey game. That's right, this is a hockey game made for his son using an Arduino and a 3D printer. The puck gives light and sound effects depending on the acceleration. And much like his last video, there is a wonderful stop motion video alongside it. Um, I do think this is an incredibly inventive way to show off your projects. Not only do you get to show the amazing projects at the end, you get to show a, a very charming animation. 
Um, and yeah, um, uh, I'm going to sound like such a stuck record because this is a lovely little project, a very nice thing to put together. Um, and uh, as you say, uh, if this is a, a project for his son, uh, this is something that I am very interested perhaps in making one day for my son. Although right now I'm not sure whether he would so much hit it along the floor like a hockey puck or throw it directly through our living room window. But there is also a YouTube video from the maker that goes into a few more details as well. But yes, it certainly does seem like it is a very popular thing uh, with the intended recipient. Um, and yes, I will leave a link to this Reddit thread in the description of this video. And in the Reddit thread, you can also find a link to the video. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's probably my favorite thing I've seen this week. Um, the idea of using a small Arduino with an accelerometer and some LEDs is nothing new. I mean, using accelerometers to change sound or LEDs is a very, very beginner project. But to put it into something as nice as this and make it a gift for a child, it just gets every tick from me. What a lovely project. <laughs> That was the Electromaker Show for this week, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. If you are enjoying it, please consider sharing it with your friends. Um, any comment left on this episode will enter you into the Mystery Box competition. But whether you want to be in the competition or not, as I always say, I am very interested in hearing what you are working on at the minute. Uh, we are going back down into lockdown here. I don't know what it's like where you are, so hopefully I'll have a, a little bit more time for projects of my own. We will see. But anyway, I hope you, wherever you are, you are having a safe, healthy and productive week. And I'll see you next time.